morning we're going to be breaking into uh, Matthew chapter 7. So we're coming, as it, might, as, as it were, into the home stretch of the Sermon on the Mount. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read verses 1 through 12. But as I mentioned in my prayer, there's really, uh, there's really two things here. It may appear as though there's three, but really two that I want us to focus on. And um, I think the, the key to the first part is found in the very last verse, which, where Jesus tells us that we are to treat others the way we want them to treat us. But the other part is in verses 7 through 11, which we're going to look at this evening, which has to do with uh, prayer, where we're going to find the power uh, to do what the Lord actually is calling us to do throughout the sermon, but particularly in <clears throat> the, uh, the opening verses of chapter 7. So let me read for you verses 1 through 12, and we're going to be looking primarily at verses 1 through 6 and verse 12. Jesus says, do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye and behold, the log is in your own eye. You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to dogs, and do not throw your pearls before swine, or they will trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father who is in heaven, or your Father who is in heaven, give what is good to those who ask him? In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you. For this is the law and the prophets. May the Lord bless his word again to our hearing uh, this morning. Now, uh, Jesus is moving on in, in his sermon from uh, the, the character that he has actually given to us through his work and by his Holy Spirit, which is what he has described for us in the Beatitudes, and from what this grace, the grace of the Holy Spirit, actually gives us the power to do, which I'll summarize by saying, is to live a life that is more honoring to God than that of the scribes and the Pharisees, uh, by living up to the true meaning of the law, by doing the things that we do to please him only and not to please man, and by fixing our eyes and our hearts on heaven rather than on the things of the world. He moves on from the characteristics and from what His grace enables us to do to a more general principle, which has to do with how we are to respond toward others when we believe they have done something wrong, or maybe when we, even when we don't think they've done something wrong, but how we are to respond towards them. And that is, of course, by not judging them. Now, we, we've all heard, I think perhaps, even perhaps from another believer, we've heard them say at one time or another, do not judge lest you be judged, by which they mean, you can't judge me for what I'm doing, even if I am doing something wrong, because Jesus says you do not have that right. Somehow thinking that Jesus has kind of given us a gag order, that prevents us from evaluating whether people do and calling them into account for it. But is that really what Jesus is saying here? Is he telling us that we should never compare what other people do by his word and decide whether it's good or bad and then respond accordingly? If that were true, if that's what Jesus actually was saying, then there's at least one thing that he tells us to do in our passage that we wouldn't be able to do. And that is uh, to determine whether or not to give the gospel to someone. 
Well, that's not what Jesus is actually saying. But what he is telling us here is this, is that we need to make sure that we use our evaluations, our judgments, our determinations about what other people are doing to help them rather than to tear them down. Do not judge lest you be judged. Now, Jesus says we need to do this. Otherwise, we may expect the same kind of treatment that we actually dish out to others. Now, this morning, what I'd like to do is basically look at three things from this, this passage. First of all, the command that we are not to condemn, judge, criticize others. Secondly, what will happen to us, what Jesus tells us will happen to us if we do. And then thirdly, then how it is that we should deal with other people in mercy and not in judgment. Now, first of all, Jesus tells us that we are not to condemn others. He says in the first verse of Matthew chapter 7, do not judge so that you will not be judged. Now, the question is, what, what does he mean by this? Well, first of all, as we saw a moment ago, he isn't forbidding us from evaluating what other people do and coming to a conclusion as to whether what they're doing is right or wrong, or even forbidding us from making conclusions from what they're doing as to what their spiritual condition might actually be. Uh, we need to make these kinds of determinations. If, if, if he was saying what people think he's saying, he would be contradicting many of the things he, he clearly tells us to do in his word, which all require making judgments or evaluations. For example, Jesus tells us that he wants us to share the gospel with the people who actually need to hear it, with people who are unconverted. But how could we tell whether or not somebody really needs to hear the gospel unless we have the ability to look at their lives and at least form some kind of opinion about their spiritual condition? I think we do that, don't we, when we determine who we're going to evangelize. If we weren't able to make any judgments, how would we ever come to the conclusion that we shouldn't share the gospel with someone, as Jesus actually tells us in verse 6? Look at what he says again in verse 6. Do not give what is holy to dogs, and do not throw your pearls before swine, or they will trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Now, what does Jesus mean by this? Well, he's using the terms or the, the, the animals, dogs and pigs, which were two animals that were unclean in the Jewish religion, which doesn't mean that they were necessarily bad, but what it meant was they couldn't be used to sacrifice. And they are things that you shouldn't eat. I'm sure those of you who are dog owners are very relieved by the fact that dogs are unclean animals and shouldn't be eaten. Now, that was, of course, in, in the Old Covenant. Now, he's, like I said, he's using them to refer to those that we have good reason to suspect would not only reject the gospel if we were to share it with them, but that they would also hurt us in some way. Now, you have to have pretty good reason to believe that that is the case before you would withhold the gospel. But that's essentially what Jesus is telling us here. If you judge that a person is only going to dishonor the Lord, then you don't share the gospel with them. If we were not to make judgments of any kind, how could we determine whether or not somebody actually falls into this category? And how then would we be able to help one another turn from the things that, that we do sometimes that we know would ultimately harm us unless we can, could conclude that what, what one another is doing is very likely to do exactly that. Okay, we have to be able to make judgments. We have to be able to make determinations. We have to be able to make comparisons with what people are doing, with what the Bible actually says. Not all judgments are prohibited by what Jesus is saying here. So the question is, what actually is he addressing? Well, he's telling us, I believe, to be careful to use what we see, our comparisons, our judgments, our evaluations, to help other people rather than to condemn them. 
Now, he's likely addressing here again, I believe, the scribes and the Pharisees whom you know thought they were perfect, thought they were righteous before God, the ones who would pull in their skirts when they saw unclean people around them, the ones who loved to look at other people and to see their faults and to condemn them and declare them to be unclean because of those faults so that they could feel better about themselves. Remember how the Pharisee prayed when he was in the temple with the tax collector? He says in Luke 18, verse 10, this was his prayer. God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector, the one who was praying next to him. Pharisees are very self-righteous, very critical of others, very judgmental. Whatever they saw, they despised people for it. Now, we do have to recognize, as, as Jesus is telling us about this, that they're not the only ones who actually do this. I mean, we all do this, don't we, to one degree or another. Uh, we all can have a critical spirit. We can all uh, attack the faults that we see in other people rather than dealing with them the way that we should. Now, sometimes we, you know, criticizing, I think, is a pretty good term to, as a synonym for what it is that Jesus is talking about here. He's not saying that we're necessarily condemning them to hell or judging them to be unworthy of salvation or something of that effect, although he may mean it in that extreme sense. But we can do it in, in perhaps lesser degrees. I thought maybe looking at some synonyms for what Jesus is talking about here would help us to see more clearly whether we actually are doing this. So the word he's using here to judge means to condemn. It also means to criticize, to tear down, to find fault with, to censure, to cast aspersion on, to disparage, or to denigrate. Now again, all these are negative things, attacks on people for the particular faults they have. But if we still don't think the shoe fits, Maybe we could look at some more modern vernacular. Uh, this word also means to give bad press to, to run down, to knock, to slam, roast, hammer, lay into, take apart, pick holes in, nitpick. It also means to trash somebody. That, that's exactly what Jesus is talking about here. And we realize that, again, some of us might be wired differently. Some of us might have more of a disposition to do this than others. But, but even if we're not the kind of person who does this openly, we can still do it secretly in our hearts. And there's a reason why we have this propensity. Certainly, it all boils down to the sin that we still have to deal with. But I think there are at least three reasons why we might be tempted to do something like this. First of all, like the Pharisees. We might want to pick on others so that we can look better to ourselves. And that's something we really need to guard against. Maybe we'll do it because we want revenge. Maybe they put us down. Maybe they talk trash about us, and so we're going to trash them. Well, Jesus tells us that we need to return a blessing if somebody curses us or turn the other cheek if they slap us. Or maybe it's because our patience begins to wear thin with someone and we begin to resent them. Maybe certain things about them which love could cover, but the love begins to grow weak and the things begin to get bigger than they really are and so we begin to attack them. Now this is really what Jesus is pointing at, uh, that we should not judge, criticize, put other people down, pick on their faults, trash them and so forth. And it should concern us not to do this, particularly because of what Jesus says next. He tells us, secondly, what will happen to us if we actually do this, if we are critical of others, if we condemn other people. Jesus tells us that, he, that, that we also will be criticized, that we also will be treated in the way that we are treating others. Again, notice Matthew 7, verse 1. He says, do not judge so that you will not be judged. Have you ever heard the old expression, whatever goes around comes around? Have you heard that before? Whatever you do to others is going to come back to you, whether it's good or bad. Now, I know that 
the world, false religions have a word for that. They call it karma. We don't believe in karma. But we do believe that God actually makes this happen. Uh, he does it, as we've already seen, to teach us what it looks like, what it feels like when you do this to someone else. He told us, for instance, that, um, you know, that we should show mercy to others, otherwise you know, the Lord will not show mercy to us. And he's reminding us of a general principle that always applies in every circumstance. And that is, we're always going to reap what we sow. Paul writes to the Galatians in Galatians 6 verse 7. He says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows. This he will also reap. Now Paul goes on to apply this generally to, to the flesh. He says, if you sow to the flesh, you will reap corruption. If you do things that strengthen the sin tendency, the sinful tendency that's in all of us, if you strengthen that, then we're going to find ourselves very soon doing more sinful things. But then he says if we sow to the Spirit, you know, if we sow into our lives the things that strengthen the Spirit's influence in us, we will find ourselves doing more of the things that are spiritual, more of the things that please Him. But this principle applies to specific areas of sin as well as general areas, sowing to the flesh, reaping from the flesh, he says, if we criticize others, which is a particular sin, he's telling us, don't do this, we will be criticized also by others, most likely by the people that we are actually criticizing. Now, let me just ask you from your own experience, haven't you found that to be the case? When you're critical of other people, they tend to be critical of you. If you, if you are emanating ill will towards people, they emanate ill will towards you. It, it comes back to you. Now, why is it that the Lord makes things to happen this way? Well, He does it to teach us, to teach us not to criticize, not to be critical. I mean, what's more concerning perhaps than this is what the Lord says He's going to do to us if we do not know Him. By the way, I just want to say that the Lord does this at two different levels. He does it in the lives of those who know Him so that he might teach us to do the right thing. But if we don't know him, he's essentially telling us if we are going to condemn other people, if we're not going to show mercy to other people, then again, he's going to not show mercy to us. Now again, I think as we think about seeing faults in people and perhaps hating them or helping them, what's the difference between the two? Well, one, of course, is sin, and it's, it's hatred, but the other is mercy. Now, what happens if we don't show mercy by helping people when we see faults in them instead of jumping on their back and criticizing them? What happens if we don't show them mercy? Well, the Lord tells us that He's not going to show us mercy. And if we don't know the Lord, essentially that means that on the day of judgment, His judgment will be more severe upon us because we were severe on other people. Now listen to what James writes in James 2, verse 13. For judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And think about what Jesus says in verse 2 of our text. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Jesus is telling us here very plainly that we are going to be treated in the same way that we treat other people. So we need to be careful how we treat other people. Jesus said in Matthew 5 verse 7, one of the virtues, one of the beatitudes that are evidences that we are believers, blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. Who's going to receive mercy from the Lord on that day? It's going to be those who showed mercy. And again, not because we worked our way into the mercy of God by showing mercy, but by showing mercy, we are showing that we have the Spirit of God living in us, working the image of Jesus in us. We show ourselves to be true believers. Now, if we understand what Jesus is saying here and we want to do what Jesus calls us to do, how should we go about doing it? Well, Jesus tells us what to do here as well. 
First of all, he tells us that when we see a fault in somebody else and we want to help them, we need to make sure that we deal with our own problem in that area before we seek to help them. Look at what Jesus says in verses 3 and 4 of our passage. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? Jesus is telling us that before we help a brother or sister, we first need to take a good look at ourselves. Are we guilty of the same thing that we're trying to correct them of? Are we perhaps even worse offenders in that area? Because he says, you know, it's like having a log in our eye while we're trying to take a speck out of our brother's eye. We have a more serious problem that we need to deal with. Now, Jesus is telling us if we don't deal with our own problems first, we're not really going to be able to do them much good. For one reason, if we try to deal with somebody else's problem, when we have a problem either in the same area or a more glaring problem, we're going to be guilty of the sin of hypocrisy. Now, I don't think Jesus meant that necessarily maliciously, although perhaps, you know, he never meant anything maliciously. But I think he was referring again to the Pharisees because this is what the Pharisees were, hypocrites. But he's pointing out that we can be guilty of the same thing if we do the same things they do. Jesus says in verse 5, You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. No one is going to accept correction from someone who's even worse than they are. We need to deal with our sins first. And I think for another reason why we need to deal with our sin first is, is this, because how are we going to hope to help a brother or sister who has a problem in a particular area unless we have been able successfully to deal with our problem first? We, you know, once we have dealt with it, once we have been humbled by our own sins in this area, we're actually going to be in the best position to help them. You know, it's really when we're humble that, that we're usable by the Lord. And think about it. If, if you've just been, you know, humbled by the Lord and brought to repentance over a particular sin, and He's freed you from it, how much you're going to be able to help your neighbor who has the same problem. For one thing, you're going to have a great deal of sympathy toward their particular issue because you just had to deal with it and you're going to deal with them more tenderly. And I believe that's what Paul has in mind when he writes to the Galatians of what should be true of us before we try to help somebody with their particular sin. He says, brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, you who are filled with the Spirit, who have these graces of the Beatitudes, not the least of which is the poor in spirit, Restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Notice restore. Don't, you know, take it and drive it through them and make them feel it even more severely. Don't attack them, but restore them in a spirit of gentleness. Each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted, even if you perhaps are not liable to that particular temptation. Uh, at least you don't think you are. You still need to be aware that you might be. And it's only by the grace of God that you're not in the same situation. So again, Jesus is essentially telling us here that we need to deal with people gently to help them when we see the fault, when we see, you know, the, the defect, whatever it may be, when we make the evaluation that they're in sin. We don't go after them. We don't attack them. We don't expose them. We don't ridicule them. We don't do all these things. Jesus is telling us not to do, but instead we seek to try to restore them. And the way we do it is, first of all, deal with our own issues. But then Jesus says, secondly, that we should also treat them the way we would want them to treat us if we were in their situation. And that's what he says in verse 12. In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you. For this is the law and the prophets. Have you ever noticed that Jesus here just gave us a summary of the entire Old Testament? What is it? that he was trying to teach us through his spirit in everything that he wrote. It was just this one thing. Treat other people the way you want them to treat you. This is what the law and the prophets are actually all about. So is, is what the Lord commanding us to do, is that a bad thing? Of course not. It's a good thing. 
to love. He wants us to love. Paul says love is the fulfillment of the law. So if we don't want to be criticized or condemned or picked on or trashed for our faults, then we shouldn't criticize or condemn or nitpick others. If we don't want others to help us when they have a worse problem than we do, then we shouldn't try to help them until we have dealt with our problems. If we want others to come to us in a spirit of love and Christian f friendship and fellowship to restore us when we're in that situation, then that is how we should approach them. Now, by the way, remember, this is exactly what Jesus did for us, isn't it? Because Jesus is the one who actually loves his neighbor the way he loves himself, and he's the only one who actually does it perfectly. Do you think when Jesus was walking with his disciples that he didn't see anything wrong with them? No, I mean, one who is perfect and who knows the law of God perfectly and can see everything, I mean, he saw all their flaws. They were just hanging out. I mean, I don't know how, if we'd be able to stand what it is that Jesus actually saw or we could even stand ourselves if we could look in the mirror and see how he sees us with those faults. But I want you to notice that even though Jesus saw them, he never ridiculed them, he never picked at them, he never uh, criticized them, but he did correct them. And he didn't correct everything at once, but he did correct the things that needed to be corrected at the time that they needed to be corrected. And he always did it in a very loving and gracious way because he loved them and he wanted to help them. He wanted to help them overcome the problem. He didn't want to destroy them. I think Jesus, they, the disciples never sensed any kind of hatred from Jesus, but only love. Even when he rebuked them, Jesus did it out of love, out of a desire to do them good. That's what he wants us to do. Now remember, when Jesus came to us and he pointed out our sins to warn us of our danger, he also did it in love that he might lead us to salvation. Those of us who know Jesus here this morning, have you ever sensed hatred coming from him? He's, he, he doesn't... When he reveals something in our lives, it is never to, to condemn us. As a matter of fact, whenever you feel condemnation in the exposing of your sin, it doesn't come from the Lord. It comes from the flesh. It comes from the enemy of our souls. It does not come from Jesus. The Spirit of God convicts to draw us to Jesus, not to drive us away from Jesus. If you feel like you're being driven away from Jesus, that is not God that is doing that. That is not what he does. He always does what he does for our good to bring us to himself because he loves us. Now, Jesus, interestingly, also knew when to withhold his help. As he told us in verse 6, not to cast our pearls before swine or give what is holy to the dogs. There were times when he was faced with dogs and with swine, that is, with the scribes and the Pharisees, when he was unwilling to entrust them with the pearls of the gospel or even with his wise and gracious counsel. There was one occasion where he told them, one group at least, not the whole group, but the group that had accused him of casting out demons by the devil, he says, you've committed a sin that is unpardonable. Uh, Jesus, as you know, when he was put on trial before the Jews, was silent. He did not speak. There was Matthew 23 where he rebukes them for all their hypocrisy and all their sin. There was a time to... Again, graciously help and correct and share the gospel, and there was a time to withdraw the gospel. Jesus tells us that we need to treat others the way that Jesus treats others. We need to follow Jesus in this example. And you know that we are actually able to do this if we know the Lord Jesus Christ because he has given to us the power to do it through the blessing of the Holy Spirit. Doesn't mean it's always easy, but it is possible if we look to the Lord for help. So if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you have the power to do what he calls you to do here. You have the power to do everything that he calls you to do in the word of God, not perfectly, but you can do it by his grace. Now the problem arises again, if you find you don't have the ability to do this, this is again a diagnostic tool that can tell us what our spiritual condition is before the Lord. If we don't have the ability to extend mercy toward other people, remember what Jesus said in our meditation, 
For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. And again, Jesus says, in the way you judge, you will be judged. If you find that all you have is a judgmental spirit that is unwilling to show mercy and forgiveness and to help other people with their particular faults, as Jesus does, then realize that, well, I, I can't tell you for sure what your state is, but if that's what your life is like, then you should perhaps suspect that you haven't experienced the Lord's mercy and you still stand in need. Remember that on that day, Jesus has just said, the Lord is going to treat you as you treat others. If you are unmerciful to others, the Lord will be unmerciful to you. And if that is the case, I want you to know this morning, the Lord in His grace and His mercy is extending His forgiveness and His mercy towards you. And He wants you to come to Him. The Bible tells us that Jesus lived and Jesus died so that all who are willing to come to Him might be saved if they will only come to Him and receive His offer of eternal life. If you do that, the Lord says He will give you the power not to criticize, not to hate, but rather to show love and to show mercy. And if that's the case with any of you here this morning, I would encourage you to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that, that concludes the, uh, the first part of what we're looking at this morning. Uh, let me just say this evening, where are we going to find the power to do what Jesus calls us to do? Well, we find it in the power of the Holy Spirit, but we get more of the Spirit through prayer. This, this evening, we're going to look at prayer, the power of prayer, the promise of prayer. We're going to be encouraged to seek the Lord not only for this, but for everything that we need. So I would encourage you uh, to come this evening uh, to continue to worship and to learn more of what the Lord has actually given to us to help us to be able to do what He has called us to do. But let's bow for just a moment of prayer now, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to apply what we've heard uh, to our lives and to give us the grace to be able to do it.